teraz bude priestor na diskusiu a poste vzniknutí. Máme čas približený do 19.50-19.35 na diskusiu. Takže kto má záujem, môže sa prihlásiť, môžete prísť k mikrofónu. Poprosím vás, ak máte záujem, môžete sa aj predstaviť, ale hlavne potom povedzte svoju konkrétnu otázku alebo pripomienku maximálne do dvoch minút, aby sa opriesali aj pre ostatní. Nech sa páči, tam je mikrofón, povedzte, či ste spomenčili alebo na uvištine a môžete položiť otázku. Dobrý deň, volám sa Ernest Grize. Čo sa týka tých trabantov, tam bol problém aj v tom, že... Čo je moment? Čo je to sa týka? Čo sa týka tých trabantov, tam bol problém aj v tom, že to obrzdili tí rúsky poradcovia, ktorí nedovolili tým plánovačom akékoľvek inovácie. Ale sú mám tie otázky. Takže žiadny ekonomický model nefunguje v nespravodlivom prostredí. Čiže tam, kde nie je vymožiteľnou správa. A toto je práve obdivuhodné na Nemecku, že sa im podarilo sfunkčniť justíciu natoľko, že to právo tam fungovalo vymožiteľnou správa. A to ja pokladám za taký úspech aj hospodársky toho Nemecka. Chcem sa vás opýtať teda, že ako je možné, že sa to podarilo v Nemecku, ak napríklad vo východných krajinách, napríklad na Slovensku, to je s tým problém, áno? A vôbec vo všetkých týchto východných krajinách. Takže čo si o tom myslíte? A ešte druhú otázku, teda ako sa dá zabrániť tej blížacej superinflácii, jak bola tá Weimarská republika, teraz je taká veľká, čo by ste navrhovali? Ďakujem. Thanks so much. So, about the Russians and East Germany, I fully agree that both in the very beginning, with, uh, well, with basically dissembling all kinds of things, they hampered East German economic growth. Um, when it comes to the engineers and the cars, probably you know more than I do. My point was that even if the engineers had all the liberty to propose whatever they wanted to propose, and even if the planners would do whatever they could do in the system of central planning, they could not plan a constantly improving car. Because a constantly improving car would mean, or basically a whole range of products which would constantly improve, would mean basically that you need to replan the whole plan of the GDR every minute for everything, right? So if you imagine the big metrics, of all the commodities and all the factories. And one factory gets more or less of this and this commodity. That basically means that you need to immediately and instantaneously replan the whole economy and that all the time, which would create chaos. So even if the engineers had all the liberty and even if the planners took all the liberty which they had, it would not have worked. Or they would have created chaos and that of course was not what they thought should they should. Now, your question about law, I will, every now and then, I'll just take the presenter and skip, switch back to some of the slides because they might help. So, your question about law is super important in the sense of my central picture. So, you have the legal order here. Now, your question is, how did Germany succeed and Slovakia or Bulgaria did not really succeed? Right. Well, I think historically, when it comes to Bulgaria, I can say that we don't really have a rule of law tradition. Right. So, Bulgarian modernity, so the formation of Bulgarian society, and I don't know enough about Slovakia. I know a lot about Austria, about Austria-Hungary, and a little bit about Czechia, but not, not enough about Slovakia. But I'll try to make the Bulgarian case, which is more extreme and better, perhaps more helpful. The Bulgarian experience with the rule of law system was very brief. It lasted from the 1880s until 1944. And then the elite, which had actually this legal experience with this legal system, was killed altogether by Stalinism. And you were left 
actually with a pre-modern communist society where this small elite which had experience with rule of law was actually gone. Russia is even worse because rule of law in Russia had an even shorter time span. So I think the success or failure <coughs> to implement the rule of law after 1990 had a lot to do with the traditions. Of course, not only. In the German case, basically all the lawyers and all the judges and all the prosecutors were kicked out and they were supplemented with West German imports. None of our countries had Western Slovakia, Western Hungary, Western Bulgaria from where we could import those people. Perhaps most importantly, um, I think in the German case, they got a legal order which was functioning well. We had to create one which is functioning well. And I think there, at least in the Bulgarian case, we never succeeded in trusting that we can do that. And then the European Union came. I'm a great fan of the European Union. But um, the corruption problems which we have are also related to the funds coming from the European Union and um, which made the tiny period in Bulgaria, the 2000s, we were trying to set up a real goal. We actually ended once we ended, but once we entered the European Union and then the corruption funds, uh, the, the European funds let corruption really explode. But I don't know if that answers the question. But again, probably in the German case, the most important point is that they copied the West German system and they imported the people physically, who would then be the judges, prosecutors, etc. Even the lawyers. In Sicko, most successful lawyers came in the early 90s from the West, and until today are quite successful and rich. We didn't have that. Dobrý deň, Igor Kosov. Mňa by zaujímala, Igor, mňa by zaujímala tá kniha e, z ale centrálneho plánovača. Dobre si to pamätám, kto to napísal, alebo teda, kde ste to našli? So, let me show the cabot briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy, so I can look. Just put it on the slide, and you can just Google. So it's a, it's a book which is widely available, right? It's not an apocryph or something like that. I'll just put it here. Um, so the guy's name is, let me take the modern car out of this so that we have more space. So the guy's name is Gerhard Schürer with a mm -hmm. Schürer. So he was in charge of the central plan economy from 1962, from 1962 until the very end. From 1962 till 1989. Actually, even more prominently. So in 1989, when Honecker is kicked out in October, um, Egon Krenz says, Professor Schurer or whatever, Comrade Schurer, um, please do a balance sheet of the GDR. So there is a thing which you can easily find from the internet, uh, which is called the Schurer Bericht, or the Schurer Report. And the Schurer Report is exceedingly interesting because it's from November 1989. Um, so the Schurer Report, or in the German case, would be Bericht. And so there, in a very profound document, he makes the final balance sheet of the GDR. He, as the guy who had run that economy for 25 years, and actually he says we are fundamentally bankrupt. So this country cannot be saved. And he's still in power, right? Now the book is called, it's an amazingly interesting book, really. Um, it's called Gewagt, which means we dared something, and then we lost. It's a, it's a big book, extremely nicely written. He was educated in Moscow in the 50s, 
But already when he talks about his economics education, you have a clear sense that um, he knows Austrian economics, he knows the critics of planning, right? So he knows what was discussed in Central Europe in the 1920s and 30s. He is knowledgeable. You sense, he doesn't name the, the, the like people like Mises and Hayek, but you can you have a very clear sense that he knows about that. So he was one of the few who would go into those prohibited sections of libraries and were, would be allowed to read. And he knew. And that's why he said, we tried to somehow manage it. And we failed, and we failed systematically, right? So it was not a human failure, it was not, uh, right? So of course he discusses also Czechoslovakia in the 60s and the experiments which he also had in the GDR. So in the GDR it was called the new system of planning and management, right? So in the whole of the Eastern Bloc you had these reformist attempts. But also there he describes why it failed, how it could not have worked very openly, so um, it's, an, it's an amazingly interesting book. If you read German, uh, please have a look, and actually I was thinking at some point at least to translate sections into English because they're super, super interesting. Also, he, he talks about um, the few innovations which were politically popular, like the chips, computers, and all that, right? So he would say, we would not allow innovations unless the Politburo says that we need chips or okay. But then he basically starts telling how you could not have that innovation. And not only that would be the easy excuse, because the West of course had an embargo on import of technology. That's not the point. He says even when innovation was wanted politically, we could not produce it because for a chip, you need all kinds of related industries, which also have to be innovative, but we were not innovative. So you can want one commodity to constantly evolve, but you cannot get that in a system which is completely static. So the whole supplementing industries will be static, and you want nevertheless the chip to get better and better. So it's a very self-critical and very wise book. And it's, yeah, it's easy to, to find on, on Amazon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Well, Igor is not my name. Uh, Germany depends on Mittelstand. And I'm really curious how uh, Mittelstand re-emerged after the Second World War because it was completely destroyed. Okay, um, so Mittelstand is both reality and a myth, okay? Sorry, it's uh, in Bulgaria we did that two months ago. Um, even in Germany, um, or even in Austria yesterday, which was probably the worst country. So, um, Mittelstand is a concept of the 19th century. It actually means, so if I get back to my very old history, those people, those sort of conservative economists who were trying to prevent a socialist revolution by providing workers with some security. We're not just worried about workers, so you would have the bourgeoisie and the workers, but they would also be worried about Mittelstand, which at that time was the stratum of German society, which was basically, you know, artisans. So people who had actually suffered quite a lot from industrialization. So people in the cities who would produce stuff, which was all of a sudden produced massively by the industry. And so they would say, we should not only look like, we should not only worry about the workers, which would be the lower stand, but also about this middle. And this, because they are potentially 
They can turn into proletarians if they are told socialist stories, but they could also be won for the new German state. For the moment, in the 19th century, it worked. But then, when you got the hyperinflation, it was specifically the middle Fund, which lost almost everything. And now your question is, how did it re-emerge after the war? Now, I wouldn't say that it was destroyed mentally, so those people existed. And if we come back to Zwickau, so Horch, who would be a typical representative of the Middle Stand, just migrated to the south. So the Bavaria, which today, of course, is an important industrial place, was extremely agricultural in 1945. But it got a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs from the former eastern part, from Berlin, from Saxony, and those people really ignited what is called the reindustrialization of Bavaria after the war. In Baden Württemberg, which is the very typical place of the Middle um, you would have initially very small factories, but those factories would understand very quickly, sorry about the clicking, but it's important, they would understand very quickly that miraculously, you don't expect that to happen quite soon, the global economy would reconsolidate. So you have a general agreement on tariffs and trade in the early 50s already. Um, and so they were very quick to recognize that you can produce one tiny component of that presenter but since the global economy is reopening, and you have the global market, at least the Western global market, you can get very rich by producing that one thing. And this is actually the non-mythical part of the Middle East. The Middle East are extremely specialized factories, which are world leaders, because they basically understood Adam Smith, which is that you have to specialize in something you're good at, and once the scope of the global market is big enough, it's perfectly fine that you produce only one tiny, tiny, tiny component of that, and this is enough. So West Germany already in the Korean War, in the early 1950s, because American, the American industry switched from normal production to military production, the West German industry got that boost all of a sudden to be able to export to America. They started exporting to America, but also, of course, later on, because of European integration to the whole of Europe, later to Asia. So there is nothing miraculous to it, but again, historically, it's um, part of society which was difficult, and I fully agree with you that today, it is part of society which actually stabilizes the country. Now the question is, digitalization, electric cars, and all of that, so how stable and how, especially how quickly will they adjust if they're in the car industry, how quickly will they adjust to, to electromobility, right? So this is the challenge. Because of course, when you're rich, there is also a tendency to get lazy and slow. So it remains to be seen how those companies are adaptive or non-adaptive to this new environment. Thank you very much. Will you all see more now, Jan? I'm in the back. Let's take it in English. I would like to ask you about Try guys in the early 2000s when Germany was called the sick man of Europe. And you can discuss the origin of the solutions by which Germany overcome this and uh, how did it change the attitude of the German people to the recording model? Thank you. Thank you for the question because it makes me feel young. That was the time when I came to Germany. I came in 1999 and indeed the country was seen from the rest of Europe and I think rightly so as the sick man of Europe. Um, it had multiple reasons. So one reason I briefly mentioned was that already in the 1980s, the system, especially the labor market, had become extremely rigid. So more and more regulations um, had made the labor market extremely difficult to adjust to crisis. So whenever you would have a crisis, unemployment would go up, but it would never go down once the crisis was over. So basically you had an accumulation of unemployment, which would go like that, without adjusting to, to the pre-crisis times. And when I came to Germany, which was briefly before the dot-com bubble burst, there were already, I would say, three million unemployed. Um, but then by the mid-2000s, you would have 
the 5 million, which are until today a traumatic figure for the country. Now, there are not many good reasons today to speak nicely of Gerhard Schröder uh, for okay. current issues, uh, and well, for 15 years actually, he has been a disastrous figure in the country because of the Moscow connection. But back then, he did something which some people compared to Ludwig Erhard. So he actually knew that it's political suicide because especially his voters, of the Social Democrats, hated those reforms. But he said, if we don't restructure the welfare state in general, and the labor market in particular, we will not get rid of this skyrocketing unemployment. Uh, and what he did were those hard reforms in the, the mid-2000s, which were about the labor market, um, but also about the welfare state, right? So he cut unemployment benefits, and he made the labor market way more flexible than it used to be. And indeed, but again, paired with the globalization boom in the 2000s, industry could export a lot. Wages basically went down uh, because people who were unemployed came in, and so general wages in the past 30 years didn't really go up, and in the 2000s, not at all. And it saved the country both materially, in the sense that it unemployment went down and the public, public finance, so the public budget was doing better. But it was especially a mentally um, important twist, which by the way coincided with the World Cup in Germany in 2006. So all of a sudden the country um, got out of this heavy depression, which was really on the minds of people. When I was a student in Hamburg, me and everybody else was fundamentally worried how we would get a job. We were all super scared of what the future. And those reforms were not just successful in terms of that they changed institutions, but they really changed the mindset. So all of a sudden there was a new optimism. Um, now, the past 20 years, ever since, uh, there were almost no reforms. So those were actually the last major reforms in Germany. Ever since the country has been doing fine, but without new adjustments. And those adjustments are necessary because the pension system, for example, is in a terrible mess. Uh, but Angela Merkel, unlike Schröder, would not do those reforms. So Schröder killed his party by doing the reforms and lost the elections immediately while she was hesitant to do so. That was good for her and for her party and for staying in power for very long, but I don't think it has been good for the country. So the country urgently needs reforms, which again would kill your career as a politician and most likely also in the midterm, your party. So uh, in a certain sense, there is a desire today that some new Gerhard Schröder might, might, address, might address those reforms. The new coalition, which was formed last fall, had a very promising start. But then, of course, Corona and now the war killed the start. So it remains to be seen whether after the end of the war there might be some new dynamism in the coalition. Um, but the promising early months, which we had in November and December, died pretty quickly. <laughs> Hi, Stefan. So uh, I know that in your last article in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, uh, you uh, spoke about the type of the West which Ukraine might be willing to to follow and to enter mm -hmm. and join. Uh, could could you tell us something more about that? Because uh, there are also anti-European ideas, uh, ideas here and, and uh, anti-Western kind of things. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Thomas. So, indeed, last week I, I published a page in this, what I at least see as the best journal newspaper, the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, and the page created a surprising echo, right? So, on Twitter, but also in some very private discussions, some people said that this is interesting. Now, 
it's not very interesting to the Eastern Europeans here, uh, people like me and you, but to the Germans it was like, wow. What I wrote is that Ukraine obviously is fighting to become a Western country, but that perhaps is a very welcome opportunity for the West to think about itself. So what does the West mean actually today? Um, do we still know what we are? Do we, does the European Union know what it stands for? NATO? Okay, NATO has not had a revival. Good for NATO, I'm very happy about that, but transatlantic relationships. Um, so I think this existential fight of Ukraine to become part of the West can, and as I see it, should be a moment where we reconsider our identity as a Western, um, as a Western civilization. Of course, in recent years, um, if you would talk on a Western campus about the West, Western civilization and all of that, it's not unlikely that you're cancelled by some people who, for some reasons, don't like the West. And of course, Western civilization has created a lot of problems and uh, colonialism was a gigantic Problem. But I, I, th I think that we know well about those mistakes which we have made, and nevertheless, there are reasons to be proud to be Western. There is something important to the Bulgarian being efficient. So, Slovaks, I think, naturally consider themselves as Western. Bulgarians, uh, being more Oriental than European, as I see it at least, have always struggled to to decide whether we are East or West, etc., uh, etc. Et so the West, when I say the West should reconsider itself, it's not a geographical entity which ends somewhere in Serbia, uh, but really um, an idea which every society at any point of time can forget about or can reinvent. In the German case, and that's the topic today, In those years, Germany developed this quite famous also in this country idea of Middle Europe, or Central Europe. And of course, Middle Europe was not just geographically central, but it was this attempt to develop an identity which is neither West nor East. Right? So it's an in-between between Russian Orthodoxy on the one hand and then French and English civilizations so Deutsche Kultur and all kinds of things. Um, it, as we know, it didn't end well. Uh, so I'm very happy that most Germans today see themselves as being Western, even though the hesitations which you see, I think, in the Social Democratic Party today, uh, Germany being the most reluctant country to do anything in that war, may still be related to this old idea that, well, we are not West and we are not East and we have to be somehow in the middle of so I find that extremely problematic, and I really hope that um, we will accept that favor which the Ukrainians are doing, are giving us, and that we should um, well, rethink what the West means, what it means as an idea, but also what it means institutionally. And that's why this is now a political statement, obviously. I firmly believe that we should get Ukraine into the European Union. Because the process of getting Ukraine into the EU will also be for us that extended opportunity to constantly talk about what Europe means. Because I'm afraid that after the end of the war, this brief window of opportunity or of reconsideration, which I mean, might quickly shut down. So if Ukraine, over five or ten years, I know, gets this European perspective, uh, it's good for Ukraine, but it's also good for us. Because the European Union, but that, that's perhaps a brief footnote, which, which is good, and a good fit for the lecture. So, Miriam Röpke, who, as you can see here, also done in the slide, uh, is somebody close to my heart, was one of the early, earliest, we can say, uh, European intellectuals in the sense that in the 1950s, he would publish in Swiss, German, Italian, and French media, and the project was, what would Europe, this new European integration, what would it mean, and how would it develop? And so he says, and I find it extremely important until today, 
that you have two ways, two trajectories how a project can develop. So one trajectory is large fronts, which means that you get a politically highly centralized entity with one big Paris, being today Brussels, and heavy economic regulations, as we typically think of France, and also to the external world, so it would be an integration market, yes, but to the outer world, it can have protectionist tendencies, as France traditionally has had. The alternative, he says, is European Union as a large Switzerland, which means, yes, it is an integrated market within itself, but it's politically highly decentralized, so democracy remains on the national or even better, on the local level. It doesn't go to Brussels. And it is an integrated market, and to the outer world it remains uh, in free trade relations. Now, I, I think that since the 1980s, since the two or three, I'm not sure, conditions of the law, we're certainly moving clearly, certainly since you and I remember the European Union, towards a large France, so it gets ever more centralized and ever more regulated. So Ukraine is perhaps an opportunity, as our countries joining in the 2000s were an opportunity which was not used, to perhaps consider whether this is smart, whether a large France is a smart option. Large France today, of course, after Corona means that we get a transfer union of sending money from the north and the south. As somebody who loves Europe, I think that those projects are harmful for Europe. So Lopke says in the 50s, in another context, that what was meant to be cement, a certain measure of integration, which was meant to be cement, turned out to be dynamite. And uh, I think some of the things which we have been doing in the past 10 to 15 years in the European Union are meant to be cement, right? So they are well meant, they are meant to promote integration, but can, be, can turn out to be dynamite in the sense that they weaken the trust and the, uh, the popularity of the European idea uh, with European citizens. So I think we might get not just <coughs> the ideational impulse from Ukraine, but also the institutional reforms, or at least the discussion about institutional reforms, which the Brexit could have meant, but we also missed the opportunity of the Brexit to, to, to briefly think, well, perhaps it was stupid of the Brits to leave, but perhaps they had some reasons to leave, so why don't we think about the reasons, and by that, um, actually think about ourselves and think about what reforms might be good for the European Union. So we have by Ukraine now a new opportunity to do that. Thank you very much, sir. Nice. So just set up Ali Napanil. Takže ja teraz postupne ukončím našu naše stretnutie, našu oficiálnu časť dnešného stretnutia, po ktorom ešte bude nasledovať to krátke prekvapenie, ktoré som už spomínal. Hneď vám dám do pozornosti, že výnimočne tento mesiac budú dve sikôs prednášky, takže už o týždeň útorok sa môžete tešiť na ďalšiu profesora Davida Friedmana, takže pevne verím, že aj, aj tam sa uvidíme. Dnes vám chcem všetkým poďakovať, že ste prišli za vašu účasť, za vašu diskusiu. Ešte raz chcem poďakovať našim partnerom za podporu a predovšetkým osobitne chcem poďakovať pánovi profesorovi za zaujímavú prednášku a vyčerpávajúce odpovede na vaše otázky. Thank you very much, Thank you, Thank you. A vidím, že ešte ostáva.